Hi everyone, it's Becky here. So welcome to another new YouTube video here on my channel. And today I am at Cabot Square, right outside at Water Metro Station in downtown. And I always find this little roundhouse to be so cute in the middle of the square. And apparently it's actually a little cafe that opens only four days a week for a few hours each day. Yeah, so I decided to sketch it in my art journal today. I used to live in one of those apartment buildings behind these trees three years ago when I started my master's degree at Concordia University. So I, this, this place is really, uh, I have an attachment to it. And here is my current sketchbook page. So I sketched the uh, statue of Queen Victoria at Victoria Square after the uh, cafe sketch. And I'm gonna sketch the roundhouse here on the upper right corner. Yeah, so here it is. And there are lots of squirrels in Montreal. All of them are so cute. Look at these little legs. I'll try to sketch one, uh, some squirrels one day. Okay, so I'm making this tutorial video in real time speed because it is a faster sketch. And as you can see, I'm putting my sketchbook on my lap. So if I speed this up, everything is gonna look very shaky for some people to watch. So I decided just to make it in real time speed so it doesn't really shake. So before I start putting ink line on paper, spend a minute or two to visualize the size and placement of the main subject matter. In this landscape, it's actually very straightforward. It's just a little roundhouse building. And I wanted to put, to put it around in the middle, not in the very middle, because a lot of times we, if we put a main subject matter in the very middle, the, the, uh, the image won't look that interesting. So it's actually a little bit on the left. I'm just starting to lay out the three-dimensional shape of this roundhouse. I I think it has six sides. It's a type of prism having six vertical sides. And from my point of view, I can see three sides. Yeah. And in between, I have these little thin columns. So again, this is like a classical little building, very similar to the crew cafe interior that I, that I did a few days ago. Yeah, just adding a little bit of accentuation around one side of each little column. So it looks like it's really, it's like a, a piece standing out nice and clear. And now I think I wanna add a little bit for the bottom. Yeah, it's actually, it should be a little bit taller. As you can see, I'm extending these vertical lines around the columns. So the bottom left side of this little building is covered by a flower bed. And so I'm just adding that right now. But before in the uh, in here, I have this garbage can or something there and the platform of the flower bed. Yeah, just adding the thickness of the sitting platform and just connecting this middle column with the top of the platform. And the finishing here and then and around the top of the sushi piece. And on the very right side, there is a box in the lower right corner. And so because this is a real time speed of drawing, I'm actually slowing down and taking my time to let my brain to digest what I see and make sense. So I'm just drawing the top part of this uh, prism. On the left, it's, it's kind of slanting down a little bit because of perspective. The line in the middle is pretty straight and the line on the right is slanting down towards the right and adding more layers around the beam. And there's like little square cube shape that pops up a little bit and another layer of beam on top. Um, I think these uh, horizontal lines on the classical architecture is called an entablature. So because I'm sketching a lot of buildings, it's good to learn new vocabularies of buildings. 
Yeah, so these horizontal and repeating lines are called entablatures right above these columns. And after the entablatures, I have the rooftop, which is a very short um, cone shape. Well, actually, it's more of a pyramid shape. Yeah, and the top is like a little button right up there. And finishing this super thin line over here that defines uh, the other column that I only can see half of it and adding these lines that defines the three-dimensional uh, structure of the rooftop really well. Yeah, and adding some more accentuations around the side of each column over here. And taking my time to see where I should put the next line. Yeah, so here's actually another layer of entablatures. And now I have this bar on top of uh, this little window. And it's the name of this little building. It's a roundhouse. And underneath the sign, I have this classical shape of the little window. And the frame carving around it. Inside, I'm starting to add these uh, divided shapes, adding a little accentuation around the side, and adding these tiny little frame bars inside the window, and coloring in some of these shapes with solid black. So during daytime, when we look at windows, a lot of the colors or pretty much like very intense, almost black, or reflecting the colors of trees, buildings around it. Yeah, and adding some accentuation in between each pieces there. And adding these very light vertical lines to show the little brick pieces. Yeah, I just want to add a little more accentuation for those pieces on the beam. So when we're doing a line drawing, all of those lines, they could be of different density and thicknesses. So as you can see, I was just adding a little more accentuation here and there for this little building. So it looks more three dimensional. And just adding this uh, window in the middle is a pretty straightforward rectangle. And adding the thin frame around it, just parallel, just parallel lines. And yeah, usually classical buildings for every single section of the building, it always contains layers of parallel lines and repetitions and these bars for the higher window frame. Yeah. So again, don't, you don't have to stress out about you know, capturing every single layer of those window frames or the building structures, okay? Yeah, so now I'm just adding these tiny little human figures sitting on a platform close to the building in the middle. So now all of a sudden, this little building is looking much bigger than you can imagine with this little figure underneath it. And just coloring the window, the glass area with black ink. And the lower part of this window is divided into three by three rows and columns of little glass panels. And color some of these tiny little squares with black ink. Yeah, so just coloring windows with black ink, it really helps your building to look stronger. It makes people, when they're looking at your picture, to imagine the depths of this building when you color the windows with solid black ink. And just adding this round window on the right side, little arc shape on the top, and again, layers of frames or carvings. And the panels, and then again, coloring the top part with black ink. And 
one of the tricks about drawing buildings is to figure out the largest three-dimensional shapes and then adding these medium to smaller details, okay? So for example, it's always a good idea to add these windows and these teeny tiny details after those overall uh, shapes and divisions of each parts are done, okay? Yeah, and just adding a little bit dark shade for the window on the left. And now I think I'm seeing a couple people sitting down on the platform. Just adding, oh, when I'm drawing people, I'm always starting with their head first. People in the distance, the head can be just a very simple little circle. And then the upper body, one leg and the other leg behind. When people are sitting, their legs are crossed. So that's one person. You don't have to define uh, the gender of that person because they're so far away. Just make it like a simple human figure. And for this one, I think he or she was standing. Yeah. Yeah, so after a little while, I always like to go back to some outlines and just give certain areas a little bit, a little bit more accentuation just by adding a couple more layers for that piece of line there. Yeah, and now I am drawing the large branches for the tree behind. So most of the branches and twigs are being covered by the foliages. It's summertime and there's an abundance of leaves on those trees. Right now I'm just drawing the uh, twigs and branches as I see drawing the twigs first and then merging the twigs into larger branches and another large branch and merging two or three large branches into a trunk. Yeah. So yeah, when drawing trees, you have to be aware that there are, are roughly three sizes of shapes. The largest shape is the trunk, medium shape, are the uh, large branches and smaller shapes are the twigs and yeah i'm just gonna leave um, the leaves a uh, blank and i'll just paint the leaves very loosely with watercolor brush strokes and now i'm just adding some tiny figures sitting in the distance adding a lamp post on the right hand side yeah just adding these urban structures is just so much fun Every single thing in a cityscape or landscape are kind of playing around with each other and giving senses of proportions. And now I'm just drawing this man. Yeah, it's actually a guy and he had a ponytail. This is the side view. His right arm. And his hand was in his pocket. Yeah, so that's his upper body. And he was wearing shorts. The other leg is actually behind, drawing his cough and his shoe. The other shoe is being covered pretty much completely by the one in the front. So as I mentioned in my previous videos, subject matters around the size of a sketch, it could just hang very loosely. So you just observe a bit of uh, more branches and twigs from another tree. I think the trunk is outside my picture frame, adding some teeny tiny little shapes for those lamp and street sign posts. A little sign there, and a little rectangular shape. And also I'm seeing in between the lamp, this lamp post and the large tree, I see a really nice shape of this uh, window of the heritage building on the other side of the street. So drawing that is pretty clearly showing to me. And add another, some, some more details. It's just very interesting. It's showing in between these green foliages. I know there are other details for that building. I'm just gonna leave the unnecessary details for that building out and just keep working more around the foreground and the middle ground area. As you can see, I'm just adding the texture for the tree trunk over here using very loose, short little lines and adding some more abstract cityscape sculptures on the left side of the roundhouse. 
think that's it for the line drawing. Now I'm ready to paint watercolors. So it actually saves a lot of time by not using the ink pen to draw all those leaves. So when I first started urban sketching about 10 years ago, I tend to draw all of those leaves with my pen. And I think that was a, like a waste of time and too much details. I'm just going to paint the leaf colors. But right now I'm actually not painting the foliages. I'm just painting the color of the building on the other side of the street on the back of those foliages. So when we're doing watercolor painting, it's always a good idea to start painting from the very back first. So in this case is this building right over here. It had this vintage orange brown color. Yeah, very much diluted. For things in the, for in the background, we don't have to make the colors so intense. This is very diluted. Red, brown, and also yellow, orange blend it together very softly. And now I'm just like looking and see what's the next part that I should paint. So on the left side, almost in the very back is this glassy building. Okay, it was a bunch of uh, it was layers of windows, rows of windows, but I'm just gonna simplify. Just with a, like a flat wash uh, using leftover gray. So this gray is kind of like a, a mix of blue, red, and tiny bit of green. Yeah, it's like a, it's a really faded color. If we paint things in the background in a very simple way like this, it's, it's, uh, it's automatically being pushed back into the distance. If we overwork and add way too much details, it's going to stand out too much and compete with the details in the foreground. Just adding these dashes to show the glossy windows. Yeah, it doesn't have to be clear. Yeah, so when painting things in the background, just relax. We don't have to be clear. It actually helps to work less uh, for things in the background. And now I am ready to paint the first layer for the foliages. It's a mix of lime green with a bit of um, lemon yellow or medium yellow or cadmium yellow, depending on what you have in your palette. It's a nice shiny green. The green that dances in the, uh, in the, in, in the bit of sunshine. And I just grabbed a little bit of cerulean blue to add on to the very top left. Yeah, on top of the building. The sky is actually on the very back of this image. Yeah, the skies are always on the very back of any landscape or cityscape. So usually when I paint a landscape or cityscape, I always like to paint the sky first, but today is an exception because I was thinking about omitting uh, the sky behind, but then I decided it's better to paint the sky, adding a, a little touch of cerulean blue just to make this picture more alive. And yeah, so you know, I never have a, a fixed recipe or rules for myself that I always, always have to follow. I do break uh, some usual routines sometimes, and that's the freedom of being an artist that we don't have to stick to rules all the time, okay? Uh, yeah, it's good to know the rules. But it's also good to break the rules at certain times. Yeah, now just keep adding this mix of a lime green with a bit of lemon yellow for um, these large chunks of foliages here and there. So when painting trees, bushes, foliages, it's, yeah, it's good to start with the lightest tone. Usually the lightest tone is like a mix of uh, yellow, such as lemon yellow with lime green for spring and summer foliages. So a lot of times it's very hard to tell the exact outline of trees of those foliage shapes. So it's okay, just let the, the first layer of green to blend a, a bit with the rest of the background colors. And now I'm adding the second layer. It's a medium green, so you could use viridian green or any um, kind of like a darker shade of green in your palette. And every single brush stroke can be of a different tone, even though we're using the same color. By controlling more or less water uh, mixed with the paint and loaded onto our brush. Yeah, as you can see, I'm just using these tiny little dots 
and bashes to show the texture. And I'm actually uh, making my brush to lay down a little bit using the side of the brush. So several brush strokes can merge together. So we don't want like a bunch of very harsh dots on those foliage areas. Some of those uh, dots can be like merging together into a soft cluster. Okay, so if we make every single leaf texture standing out in clear dots, it's going to look too, um, too busy or something and not so relaxing to look at. As you can see, I'm actually merging a lot of those brush strokes together into very soft clusters. And just keep going. Again, uh, observe and see where the darkest tone, where, where the darker tones are, okay? We do have to leave some areas from the first layer, that bright yellow-green, unpainted. Yeah, some parts unpainted. And as we gradually adding this second and, and this third layer, we're not overpainting. So every brush stroke should be a bit reasonable and not just randomly put in those areas. I'm also trying to feel the direction of growth of those leaves. So these brush strokes are actually kind of following the direction of the leaves draping down from the tree. So not really random brush strokes. Yeah, just adding a little more for the bottom. I think there's a bush there. Yeah, I think these foliages are pretty much done. And I'm trying to see and see if there's any extra brush strokes that I need to add. I think that's it. Just letting the foliage area go and let it be and not overwork. It already had a lot of nice rhythm in the foliages. So yeah, I'm working towards the uh, lower part of the image. Yeah, just a couple more shade under there. Just grabbing a little bit of blue, mix it with uh, leftover colors to get this gray tone to paint these concrete sitting platforms around the lower part of the picture and here for this slab as well. Yeah. It's painting very loosely with a little bit of transition from left to right. So when we're painting watercolors, the, the same area, they're like the same shape. It doesn't have to be exactly the same flat tone throughout. Our brush strokes can be very loosely pressed on and yeah, just leave some traces of brush mark. It's just totally fine. And now just grabbing a little bit of brown dilute it and just paint it around the little roof of the roundhouse leaving a little bit white to show the bit of shine I think it's a kind of like a metallic rooftop yeah the color is a little rusty or maybe just rustic and scrubbing a little bit of royal purple mixed with the blue to paint the concrete color of the main body of this building Again, very lightly. This is a super diluted gray. This gray stone color. And just paint the ground area as well with this leftover color. Yeah, so just grab this, uh, this mix of blue and leftover green to get this muted turquoise color for the shade colors around this round house, according to my observation, using very thin brush strokes here and there around the borders of each medium to small shapes. And again, not overpaint because I still need to leave some very light grays to let this building shine. Yeah, so painting in watercolors, sometimes it looks very easy, but actually good work, it takes a while just to let the brush rub against the paper and switching to my smaller tip water brush just so it's easier to, you know, put some tiny little bit of values around some gap areas, around the edges. I think every single brush stroke is pretty important, even though some brush strokes are kind of invisible, it's still there.
Yeah, I think I'm gonna add a slightly darker brown value for the rooftop. Yeah. So this little roundhouse looks is more prominent with this uh, brown rooftop, and also uh, leaving previous layers brighter just to let the rooftop shine as well, not just solid brown. And just painting the bushes down there. A little bit of green reflecting onto the platform side. Yeah, just grabbing a tiny little bit of red to paint the frame of that window on the other side of the street. And paint the glassy part of, of these windows with leftover gray, very much diluted. Um, a lot of areas of these windows are actually pretty bright. They're not super intense. So when we're painting windows, yeah, it, it's not just really solid black or like a super intense gray. There are some shiny parts reflecting things around its environment. So sometimes if you really pay attention, you can see the uh, glasses on the windows reflecting the greens from the trees around it. Yeah, just adding a little bit brown for the twigs, for these trees, paint very lightly. Yeah, so there's something I like about this paper is that it can leave little traces of brush strokes uh, that work on it. So I don't like to flatten and merge all of my brush strokes, especially for, for the foliages. It's very important to leave those brush strokes a little sharper, but not too sharp. If we make every single brush stroke of the foliages really sharp, then this sketch is gonna look too busy. So it really takes some control, just so that we're making those foliage brush strokes um, sharp enough, you know, re realistic enough, but not way too sharp. Otherwise this sketch is gonna look way too busy. Yeah, so yeah, just keep adding this brownish green for the tree trunk there and use the leftover color to paint those little uh, poles here and there lamp posts traffic sign posts and I just I think I'm gonna paint this guy's shirt red I think he was wearing a red shirt he already walked away so I had to use my memory to paint a lot of the time because a lot of things in the back is actually green and gray, so it's good to have a bright color uh, that draws a viewer in the foreground. So yeah, it's a good idea to uh, make the shirt red and blue shirts. And painting his leg with a leftover brown for his skin color, adding a little bit leftover and diluted brown for the uh, little bit of rocky round area. Yeah, I think right now I need just need a couple more minutes to add some more stronger accentuations for the uh, for this little roundhouse because this is the main subject matter. Yeah, just using my small tip paintbrush to add a bit of a stronger gray. A little bit of orange over there. I think there's like an orange, uh, like a wooden box over there or something. Yeah. Some little details for the twigs and tree texture. Um, and painting from real life observation is, t is that every moment is actually different. So after a while, a while, I'm coming back to this middle to background area around the foliages. There's actually, a, I have slight different sensation compared to like 10 to 15 minutes ago. Yeah, because the world, the environment is always changing. It's not a static photo. And now I just painted the uh, the upper body and legs for these people sitting on the platform. Yeah, every moment is different. And you can just, when you're drawing, you can just keep adding maybe one extra person on the side. If you take a photo, you probably want, you probably may not include that person. But yeah, sometimes there could be like a really inspiring person or an animal comes into your your, your selective frame and you might want to include those elements in your sketches so 
uh, reality can be unpredictable, but it's always so rewarding. The fun stuff is all in the unpredictable. And now I'm just adding another layer of uh, very intense green values by mixing a little bit of uh, blue and a tiny bit of uh, brown or burnt sienna into the green. Yeah, so for this step, for this super nice and sharp contrast, we need to be very brave. And these intense greens are actually pretty minimal. Because it's an overcast day, there are quite, you know, a, some percentage of areas of the foliage containing this very dark green tone. So if it's very, very sunny, there's going to be less of this darkest green tone around these trees. So it really depends on the weather. Yeah, so most of this darkest green value is around the middle to the bottom of the tree where the leaves are the, the most dense. Okay, so yeah, very rarely we see super dark green tones around the very top of the trees where the leaves are pretty loose. And just final sharp lines around the roundhouse edges here and there. And I think that's it. I'm going to call it done now and not overwork on it. So here's the look of my finished sketch. So it took me just about 30 minutes to do the line work and painting on location. And here's the finished look in detail. Yeah, pretty impressionistic. And that's it. It's now it's time to go home. It's been a pretty busy day with other parts of my life and walking back to the metro station. So thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. If you like it, please click like and leave me a comment below. Subscribe to my channel for future updates. So I up update this channel two to three times a week. I will see you very soon next time. Have a great day, everyone.